own the roof. Why rent when you can own the roof? We specialize in connecting renters and home buyers with down payment assistance programs and grants currently available, even with less than average credit. Let us show you how to purchase a home with just a few thousand dollars out of pocket. Attend our free weekly webinar, The Top Ways to Purchase with No Money Down, by registering at nodownpaymentrequired.org. Okay, thank you for attending my webinar. Today, we're going to go over the home buying process, specifically five simple steps to buying a home with no money down using some of these down payment assistance programs and grants that I help connect people with. Now, what I'm going to do is jump into the steps that uh, we're going to go over. So the number one step that I always suggest that people do is basically assess your financial situations. We want to know your current income, expenses, credit score scores. And we want to kind of get our minds wrapped around that so we can coach you as far as what program would be the best fit for you. What do we look for when we look at the current income? We need to calculate your income. I put my mortgage hat on at that time and try to calculate, hey, what are most mortgage companies going to look for? So when it comes to calculating your income, they do it on a monthly basis. So if you're paid hourly, we're going to take that hourly rate. We're going to multiply that by 40 hours, by 52 weeks in the year, divide that by 12. That's how we get a monthly income. If you have a salary, Obviously, that's a lot easier to calculate on an, a monthly basis. If you are self-employed or receive 1099 income, they are always going to take that income and average it over at least two years. Self-employed people, just be aware of that. If you have less than full-time income, so if you are a part-time employee, they do want to see a two-year history of the part-time income in order to uh, calculate your numbers there. Now, when it comes to employment, they do want to see a two-year history, but it, that two-year history can be spread out over three years if there's some job gaps in there. We just need a letter of explanation, just, just clarifying why you're off. So that's what they do to calculate income in the mortgage world. The next thing that we need to get our mind wrapped around is what are your expenses? They are looking at things for the most part that are only going to show up on your credit report and your pay stuff. They're going to look at, uh, when it comes to your credit report, typically auto loans, credit cards, student loans, personal loans, things like that. Those are the things that typically show up on most people's credit reports. There might be some baggage. If there are, we need to know about that too. They'll pick it up on the credit report. For example, any old collections and things that are out there. With regards to other things to look for, they look at your pay stubs. So they are going to see if any debts are showing up on your pay stubs. If you have any child support that might go to the front of the court, loans that have to be paid back for 401k, or any garnishments that may show up on your pay stub, those are also debts that they're going to take into account. For the most part, most people are just going to be concerned with what's showing up on the credit report. Those are the debts that they're going to use to calculate your debt to income ratios in the mortgage business. A lot of these programs depend on what your DTI or debt to income ratios are. Now we're going to look at your credit scores. When it comes to credit scores, they will pull all three bureaus. In the mortgage world, they do what's called a tri-merge. A tri-merge is just a credit report that grabs all three credit bureaus and puts it into one nice report with all three credit bureaus. At the same time, you're going to get all three credit scores from each credit bureau. They use the FICO scoring models, two, three, four, and five. In order to qualify for any of the programs that I typically work with, we need to have credit scores above a 600. When it comes to the credit scores, they pull the FICO, to either the two, three, four, five, they are going to take the middle credit score. That's what they use. Doesn't matter matter which bureau it is, but the middle one. So your middle credit score has to be 600 or higher. And then obviously your higher credit score is certainly going to be higher than 600. Doesn't matter how low the third one is, just the middle credit score. There, oh, here, I did put down the address to the webinar tomorrow night. You can see it in the slide, credit.nodownpaymentrequired.org. And again, if your credit score is in the 500s, don't wait. Just reach out to me. I'm happy to look at your personal situation 
with credit scores. That's how that works out. Now, the last piece of this financial situation is your debt to income ratios that I mentioned previously. So what are debt to income ratios? It's basically, they don't wanna see any more than 45% of your income going to your house payment and the debts that are showing up on your credit report and possibly on your pay stub. Remember I ran that, uh, I ran a number earlier, $20 an hour. $20 an hour breaks down to an income of $3,466 a month. Now, if we take 0.45, that tells me $1,559, let's just say $1,560 a month can go to your house payment and your overall debts. If you have $1,560 a month going to all of your bills and your house payment, and we want to look for $150,000 house, it's going to be a $1,200 payment. That tells me that only $360 a month can go to your car payment, credit cards, student loans, whatever else is out there. As long as those bills are under 360, we're good. Now, I realize a lot of people make a lot more than that amount, okay, than $20 an hour. On the programs that I'm going to talk about, debt to income ratios, again, just the percentage of your income, and this is your gross income, your income before taxes are taken out, that 45% of your income can go to your house payment and your overall debts. To give you a gauge, like I said, $150,000 right now translates to about a $1,200 house payment. About 175, add another 150 to it. 200 is uh, maybe up to 16, and then 225 might take you up to about 1800 a month. Keep in mind, those payments are not etched in stone, and the reason is the taxes on different houses in different areas can vary greatly. So you got to give me some leeway on that. Remember I said earlier, your income needs to be needs needs to have some stability to it. So they want to see a two-year track record of working. That can be multiple employers. Now, a lot of these programs that I connect people with do have credit requirements. Like I said, besides the credit scores, they may have credit requirements that might be no 30-day lates in the 12 past 12 months or past 24 months. And when I say 30-day lates, that could be for like a car or a credit card. Isolated late payments, one, you know, one 30-day late, we can probably get away with. I've gotten away with two. When we see more than two over a 12-month period, that becomes a little bit more of a sticking point and we need to get a good, what we call cry letter to try and explain that away. And we're pretty good at helping you draft those. You know, the next thing we want to talk about are assets. I don't focus on assets assets all that much. And the reason is I, I consider that my job. I'm going to connect you with down payment assistance programs, grants, seller concessions, if need be lender credits or another way to do, get things across the finish line. So there's the assets are actually the easy part for me. The hard part usually is the income. The credit's also something that's not too challenging. That's why I do the credit webinars. Rent history is another thing that gets factored into the equation. Some of these programs, you have to have rent history. There are some programs that don't require any rent histories. I need to know your story in order to coach you as far as what program is going to be the best way to go. And then the next thing is payment shock. If you've never had a rent payment before and all of a sudden you're going to go to a $2,000 payment, that's a big payment shock. That's going to be something that might be a hurdle for us if the overall doesn't look too favorable. If the numbers are tight, payment shock is going to be an issue. But we, they also take that as relative to where rental payments are. Okay, so for the most part, a lot of the underwriters know that apartments typically are going to be anywhere between $1,300 to $1,400 right now. So going from zero to $1,300 or $1,400 is not as big of a task, just knowing that that's what people have to pay to keep a roof over their head. It's when you go from zero to $2,000 a month that sometimes the payment shock comes in or becomes a topic of conversation. Those are the things that we want to assess for you on the financial side. That's number one. 